right? Employees are um, more remote, more disconnected than ever before. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I have this with my own teams and they, they keep saying, we want to feel connected and we're working remote. And it, it leads to this idea, the world is changing. So how do we use the change framework to address those two issues mm -hmm. and help employees discover new and better ways to work together? And um, it's just been really rewarding to go address that need. And so we thought we'd share a little bit about it. Leadership Story Talks, where we discuss the practices that engage, motivate, develop, retain, and attract people to businesses. We'll give you principles and tools based on real-world stories to leverage listening and storytelling to become a better leader and management professional. Leadership Story Talks is produced by Narrative, a company that focuses on personal storytelling for business. Welcome to Leadership Story Talks. Hi, I'm Jerome DeRoy, CEO of Narrative. And I'm Julian B. Ryan, and it's great to be back with you. Yes, absolutely good to see you. And today we have a special guest, a returning guest, actually, Curtis Bateman. He's the best-selling co-author of Change, How to Turn Uncertainty into Opportunity. He's Vice President of Direct International Offices for Franklin Covey. With over 24 years of experience in the training industry, Curtis is an internationally recognized presenter, content developer, change consultant, business leader, and coach. His passion for enabling organizations at change resulted in the co-creation of transformative industry-leading solutions, including Change Element, Leaders at Change, Managing Millennials, Millennials at Work, and the Change Practitioner. Formerly the president and CEO of, at uh, Red Tree Leadership, Curtis managed the world-class brand Who Moved My Cheese and created a practical approach to help individuals and leaders succeed within an ever complex world of change in the workplace. So Curtis, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. It is great to be back with you too. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm so glad that you're back because, um, and clearly your, your uh, subject matter, um, you know, is, is still change. <laughs> the last time you were here, we talked about your book um, and, um, and, and really, you know, now we're, we're going to talk about a, a specific framework, but maybe we can sort of stop, start there. Uh, if you can give us a little reminder of, you know, what is that process of change or why the focus on change? Yeah, that's a great starting point. So the, the process of change is, is really pretty straightforward and understandable. There are four zones that we encounter as we move through this curve of change. And the four zones are the zone of status quo, life before the change. Then there's the moment the change gets introduced. And at that point, um, a lot of uncertainty enters our life. We call it the zone of disruption. People are mm -hmm. really clamoring, struggling, searching to understand what's changing, why is it changing, and what in the world does the change mean to me? At some point, all of that information starts to coalesce and they, they are able to pass through the point of decision, which is, I am going to engage in the change, or we enter the zone of adoption. And the zone of adoption is, is the part that most of us probably think about when we think about change. It's the hard work of how do we implement this? What are the new things we're doing? There are setbacks, there are successes, there are amazing discoveries, and it's the hard work of change. It's also the space where most changes kind of run out of steam. They run out of energy if we're not careful. Those that persist find that they make it through that zone, and suddenly it opens up these really interesting vistas of what else could we do? What else is possible? And when you hit that space, then you start to really accelerate the innovation, the zone of innovation, where we're learning from the work we've done, we're finding new ideas, we're amplifying, we're accelerating, and we're creating more and more value from the change. Mm -hmm. And every change goes through this process. People say, oh, don't we, can't we skip this zone or that zone? Well, as much as I would love to say yes, in all of my years of studying this, working on it, researching it, helping with it, the answer is we never skip one of those zones. We might be able to move faster or with less impact, but we never skip any of those zones. 
Mm, yeah, you're you're disappointing a lot of people, I think, here. I know, I know, I hate to. <laughs> There's I, no silver bullet. <laughs> but I got to tell you, Curtis, like um, I was working for quite a while before I decided to go spend a lot of money at graduate school and learn about organizational change and counseling and everything. But I learned a lot with fantastic professors, but I learned so much. I ended up being at a na multinational company that in supply chain that was going through selling companies, changing presidents every two, new products, SAP, merger. It was endless. And I was like, okay, now I understand what I was reading and what I'm seeing where people were frozen. Because in that case, it was everything all the time, all at once, and it never stopped and it kept coming. So and then they gave us a book, Who Moved My Cheese? But we're going to divot, divot to that later, um, yeah. further yeah. on in the podcast. I'm glad you I'm glad you pointed that out, Jules. The, the reality is leaders can think about all these changes and they activate them. Go make it happen. Mm -hmm. And all of the work to make that happen is downstream. And so it is a real risk for leaders to keep piling on more and more and more change which is what leads to this experience bias that people have that says change is hard. It's lousy. I don't like it. It never works out for me for some of the reasons you, you lived through. Mm, yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. And, and, you know, there's um, so, so in order to, and, you know, I, I facetiously said that a lot of people are going to be disappointed, but there is that, that sort of notion that, I mean, and I'm glad you said this, that you can't really skip through any of these um, uh in, in this process, you can't skip through the steps of the process, right? Yeah, that's um, right. I'm glad you pointed that out because there is a, I think, certainly in our industry, you know, we're all, at least Jules and I, and I think to you, Franklin Covey to a certain extent too, is, you know, learning and development and training and and people come into training programs and often with an expectation that they're going to leave with some kind of, you know, I mean, silver bullet might be a little bit maybe even maybe they don't have that that particular expectation but there is some kind of expectation there of you know i'm going to come in this and this is going to teach me exactly you know what i need and i'll have i'll have one step and that's it you know and then i'll have that I solution will not be in pain. i will not it, be in agony <laughs> exactly i will not exactly I and mean, i will not be uncomfortable doing i'm giving the queen's version of like you know, yes yeah there yeah. won't be any discomfort you know, along the way there won't but, be but, revolutions in the conference room none of that will happen it'll all be golden and then you move to different industries and go guys it's the same nonsense different channel different brand different product but, but the the and then the aha moment comes oh. when people see that actually it's in that uncomfortable place that there's so much learning. And I wonder, I wonder, Curtis, if you can speak to that in terms of, mm -hmm. you know, that because you have a particular framework with change, and maybe you could speak to that a little bit, and sp specifically that that piece where, you know, what's that moment of of inflection where, ah, okay, I think I get it now. And because in my experience, it's often in those moments of struggle and pain, conflict and discomfort that something you come out the other side and that's where you're like, oh, that's when I learned rather than when I was super comfortable and, you know, feeling stimulated. Yeah, that is such a great insight. The the stretch, the pain, the discomfort helps us grow. It helps us discover new skills, new capabilities. And the goal isn't to eliminate that journey. Now, we do want to help people understand through the framework there is a predictable process. So what you're experiencing is known. It's not this unknown. It is a predictable process. And if we apply some capability, some tools, some leadership skills to it, can, can we compress it in both axes, right? The horizontal. And if we can do that, then, then we do improve the, the pain part of it. And we get to the really lovely outcomes part of it sooner but we do it together and mm. i often talk to people i said what if you could make the next change 20 percent better to your point drum about the silver bullet i'm not saying what if we could make it perfect i'm saying what if it were 20 percent better what would that look like and feel like or if we kept working at it what if a year from now the next change is 40 percent better how would that be and when people start to realize that's what we're trying to accomplish and that the journey is important, it, it helps them accept and take in 
it's going to be hard, but we have the tools, the skills, and the understanding to know where we're going. And so we can start to see it as an opportunity rather than look at it through our historical lens, through our experience bias that says it's always lousy. And when we start to see opportunity, it motivates us and helps us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Julian, you're, you're smiling. I'm, I'm having <laughs> flashbacks. It's like a therapy session. I mean, I'm just, <laughs> I'm going to be calling my old boss in Kentucky afterwards, which is her job. <laughs> There's one company in particular that stands out in my mind. Um, but it is true. And also that whole thing of having people to, I celebrate such an overused word, but sometimes there's no pause and there's no place to say, oh, you did it, you made it because there's something else coming at you and that you're going to say, well, you have 10 seconds, celebrate now and you got to move on and get on the plane too, by the way. We didn't tell you that. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> Pack your bag. Um, so it's always swirling around. So, and I think we expect a lot. And then the, and um, I think the timing. Uh, so I'm always interested in how you coach with this framework of what's reasonable mm -hmm. and what's um doable for people yeah. yeah i think you've hit on probably two different questions that i'd like to give a brief answer to both and i'll, I'll start with your second question which is the the, the number of changes and the, the relentless expectation the pressure um one of our other practices or areas of study is the four disciplines of execution and this talks about how do you take key initiatives and go action them We've done a lot of research there, and the data shows that if you've got one to two, maybe three initiatives, you can execute on them with excellence. When you start to get into that four to seven, you can execute on them with mediocrity. And once you start to get into that double digit area, you just don't execute on any of them. And, and I think that line of thinking applies to changes which mm -hmm. is part of the reason we encourage leaders to look at what's the cost of the change and what's the outcome, the top part of the curve. And if the benefit doesn't produce a significant enough um, return on investment over the cost, then the question should be, is this a smart change? Or if it's a less valuable change, can we do it at a later point? So that we're intentional about when and why we're choosing to change and we execute on a few changes at once with excellence and then develop that muscle to move on to the next ones more effective. So that's that's one of the answers. The other question I think you asked, or that I well, I think you asked, is you know, coaching to it. And in the in the second two zones, there are some intentional leadership behaviors we want to encourage so that we derive some joy and satisfaction and celebration along the way. So when we try something new in the zone of adoption and it works, we need to celebrate that. If that's the team or an individual or, or a larger group, when there are things that start to go well, we need to pause and celebrate. The change isn't done, but celebrating the progress builds momentum. And then the second thing is in that fourth zone, the zone of innovation, one of the things that we really encourage to create as much momentum is to start telling the story of the change. Tell the story and tell it in a way that it gives you the chance to talk about what was hard, what mm -hmm. was easy, what we learned. And when you tell that story to external stakeholders, um, it gives you the chance to celebrate and recognize both people and process contribution along the way, rather than waiting to the end and go, did it, pizza party, let's start the next thing. Mm -hmm. we, we try and weave it into the framework along the way. Hmm. That, that's super interesting because, you know, one of my questions um, was going to be about the role of storytelling in the process of nav navigating change, and, and you just answered it. Um, and I think that's really interesting that it's, you know, towards the end uh, or after the celebration, right? We've gone through this as a way of sharing lessons learned. And I would imagine also as a kind of springboard towards what's next, what can we do better, you know, how, or how do we do better next time? Is that is that a fair representation of how you use storytelling? Yeah, yeah. There are two very clear storytelling spaces in the change model. Obviously, storytelling works everywhere from a leadership perspective, but there are mm. there are 
are two spaces where I'm very deliberate to talk to leaders about that. One is as we're introducing a change and we're inviting our people to engage in a change, there, there's, there's envisioning or storytelling that says, why are we at this point? And what can I see in the future that represents why we would go through this change? So that's a very strategic storytelling to invite people to engage in the change. And then the other one, Jerome, is what you were just talking about. And that is, as we start to reach the last quartile of the change, let's use storytelling to learn and to celebrate and then to prompt what else could this lead to? Or what if we tried this? So we use storytelling as a way to accelerate and enhance innovation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And why do you think that's so effective in terms of that last piece of, of a way of accelerating and enhancing innovation? Well, first of all, everybody loves to tell their war stories. Can you believe we had to do this? And right, people want that space to be recognized for the hard work. Hmm. And when you do that with other stakeholders or colleagues or people that are tangential to the change, they seem to know enough about what you're doing that they can then say, did you ever think about this? Or how did you address this? And those curiosity questions provoke more innovation. Mm, yeah. And so it's th those two things combined that really, really creates value there. Mm -hmm. And further down storytelling, I learned this intuitively and I didn't fully appreciate it. It really served a purpose when we were recruiting whether it was internal hires or external hires, that we were just telling some of those war stories. We wanted people to know the good, bad, and ugly that was going yeah. on, to be resilient. But it was a way of repeating and telling yeah. and just bonding people together. Now, at that time, I didn't fully appreciate the value, but I just felt like we need to be educated mm -hmm. consumers when we bring people in so we can retain them. And we were also up against maybe not always being able to meet the salaries and the mm -hmm. packages. So we had to we had to win them over with curiosity and this is going yep. to be an awesome experience you're not going to sleep for about two years but that's okay mm. but, you're doing <laughs> but join us <laughs> so, yeah you know but it, and it was an esprit de corps that came out of it and i can still see it in my own life or oh, how those people still show up so it the storytelling really did matter in very unplanned spontaneous ways it does and you highlighted an important thing not every change is going to be a great change there there, there are the reality is that some changes are super difficult, but that doesn't mean you can't engage people in a meaningful way like you're describing, Jules, that you, you mm. certainly can. Yeah. I'm curious, Curtis, about the, um, the, the the specific framework of the three C's and whether you could tell us a little bit more about that. Mm. Yeah. So the three C's came about, we like to go out and listen to clients and understand what topics are top of mind for them. And of course, you, you, everybody will recognize this. And we talk about connection, collaboration in times of change. I mean, that, that just fits into the world we live in. But as we heard that, we, we decided to assemble our um, content, three of our content areas in a way that would address that. And we started sharing it in some, some of our events and activities that we do. And it's really resonated with clients. So it's, it's really simply communication, or sorry, connection, collaboration in, in the times of change. And it just fits together really nicely. And it allows people to talk about where employees are, right? Employees are um, more remote, more disconnected than ever before. Yeah. And I mean, I have this with my own teams and they, they keep saying, we wanna feel connected and we're working remote. And it, it leads to this idea the world is changing. So how do we use the change framework to address those two issues mm -hmm. and help employees discover new and better ways to work together? And um, it's just been really rewarding to go address that need. And so we thought we'd share a little bit about it. Yeah, yeah. It, it makes a lot of sense to me. You know, there, there's in terms of the, the disconnect people are feeling and that you would focus on, you know, how do we get people, it was, you know, the, the collaboration piece as well uh, is going to be affected by that. And, and that that is, I mean, certainly in, in my professional time over the last 20 years, it, you know, that's probably been a seismic event in terms of, 
you know, working remote. I mean, I'm sure for some people, uh, you know, maybe in tech, et cetera, it, it wasn't such an unusual thing, but that it became so ubiquitous so suddenly um, that at some point you would be remote even, and, and that it's persisted even today, um, you know, past the pandemic, we're, we're sort of, you know, only going back to, it seems to me, mostly hybrid uh, versions of this. And so there's always that little piece of of being remote and, and people are really struggling with this. And and yeah, it's that tension between, I want to go back and feel connected, but at the same time, I've gotten used to the advantages of working from home and you know not having to commute, et cetera, et cetera, and, and being able to do house chores that I wasn't able, able to do before, right? Uh, or spend more time with my family. And so I wonder, what are you kind of seeing in terms of you know the the challenge of that the, the the challenge of sort of walking people through the or navigating people through the that that particular change what's what's most challenging about that i think it's that's a great question i think what we see is we have people in the zone of disruption in some organizations we have people in the zone of adoption and some that are a little more experienced or energized by this that really can see the value and there's in the zone of innovation so we see people, teams, organizations in all three zones. Mm. And, you know, walking them through it is both leader and culture unique. It's, it's different in every one of those, right? There's different levels of trust. There's different levels and methods of communication. Um, leaders have different levels of capability around how they engage their teams. So, you have to put all of those ingredients in the mixing bowl and say, okay, what's the best diagnosis here? Some need to work on building higher trust. Some need to work on building higher accountability. Some need to recognize where individuals are in the change framework and then think about how to move them forward. And for some, it means there's learning some new communication capabilities. Mm -hmm. And we, we all know that's such a great leadership competency and, and all of that means, gosh, as a leader and as a team, what are we going to do with all those ingredients and how are we going to do something about it mm -hmm. um, to make progress? I had one of my teams on a call just this morning and they were going, they were using our own trust content, going through a session and they were saying, we need more connection. And the trust facilitator said, you're telling me that to get connection, you need the business to do something to bring you together. What's your ownership? Where are you proactively reaching out to peers and colleagues that you don't speak with as often? And that's an interesting statement because I think it highlights this idea that people historically are accustomed to the organization mm -hmm. taking mm -hmm. care of that connection responsibility. And in this new world, there is some, some reality that I'm remote or I'm hybrid. What's my level of ownership that I have to take in the connection piece, which is really mm -hmm. tricky for people. Yeah. 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 That's so, yeah. Go ahead, Jules. Yeah. Especially when it's, I'm, I'm thinking of examples, especially when there's been a dissonance or there's a little disruption or there pending conflict. Like my expression way back when, when we were in, in person was go visit people in their natural habitat. Like get out of your chair. Don't send another multi-copied email to the to the world. Get up, go see somebody, have a face-to-face -face conversation. Yep. Now, when we are virtual is work on recreating that, picking up the phone or pinging somebody, say have a live voice-to-voice -voice conversation so you can build some trust. So I'm wondering how you're coaching that for generations that are now more comfortable with pinging mm -hmm. and not speaking maybe yeah. as much live as, and that that does help so i'm curious what you've yes. learned over this time period yeah you know i i wanted to have some evidence before i started saying this so i went and talked to a couple of psychologists about this mm. and i said you know everybody tells me how important being face to face is live mm. and in person and they said absolutely and I said, how close can you get to recreating that in a virtual environment? Mm -hmm. And they said, if you're in a one-on-one -on -one video conversation and you're engaged with each other, it's 95% the same amount of benefit. Mm -hmm. 
which helped me feel confident saying to people, I, I totally understand you'd like to be in the same room. The world has changed. But what I do know is if you'll get in the same room together, even virtually, and you'll look each other in the eye, and it's just the two of you and you're present, you can derive the same value, the same level of outcome. So the first thing is, I, th I think that I've got enough evidence to say it can work in a virtual yeah. environment. Obviously, we would never want that to replace being live 100% of the time, but it does work. And teams are more distributed. People moved remote. They celebrated the opportunity to live where they want. And so it can work if you choose to get on. So then the question is, how do you do that? Uh -huh. I, I encourage people to do three things. Number one, as you schedule and manage your time, if you are hybrid and together, don't book that entire day with Zoom calls or Teams calls, right? Leave white space for the ad hoc to happen. And I found a lot of teams that they would, they carried on that pandemic work at home every day, every hour is booked back to back. I said, create space when you are in person so you can grab a cup of coffee and chat. Hmm. Point two, on your remote days, leave space so that you have time to be proactive and do something. And then number three, be proactive and do something. Think about which colleague have I not connected with? Who did I hear on a team call that might value my connection? And then just call them. Don't schedule it. Look for them to be green, whatever the method is. Pick up a phone, walk and talk. Obviously, that's not quite the same, but, but be proactive. Use the space you've created for yourself to do just that. And that's the part people struggle with. They don't want to take the ownership to do it. Well, but if connection matters to you as much as you're telling me, you've got to own your own thing. Mm -hmm. Now, as a company, what, you know, what are some things I do as a leader? I do set up, just like we did during the pandemic, some social interactions to encourage that. But I can't fill all of that space. So choose to fill it yourself. Even you just leave a message and acknowledge... Yep. I, I think we missed each other, call me or say something, we'll clear it later, just that acknowledge. So I think that is great reinforcement uh, and a great reminder. I think that's our one of our pull quotes, Jerome. Yeah, to yeah. yeah, and it's very it practical. Yeah. You know, it's very practical, it's very simple. Um, it, we're not asking people to, to do something that's out of um, scope, let's say, or out of oh. the ordinary even, right? It's it's something that we naturally do as human beings. You know, we, we we go out and we connect with someone, whether that's family or friends, et cetera. So why not have space for that at work, right? Um, that, that makes a lot of sense to me. You know, the other thing I wanted to say, Curtis, is that uh, when you were speaking about that example um, and, and the person asked, you know, where's your ownership uh, in terms of, you know, what are you going to do about connecting with people. And you've just given us three, three ways that people can do that. But that idea that, you know, we sort of anticipate that the organization is going to tell us even unconsciously, you know, yeah. so we walk into our office, uh, or, or even our virtual office, and, you know, we expect an email that's going to tell us how, how this is all going to go, right? Um, or, or the CEO is going to tell us. And it just reminded me that when I was a kid, uh, my mother's favorite quote Whenever I had three siblings, there were four of us. And so whenever, you know, we all wanted different things at different times. And my mother was a, was a stay-at-home mom. And so she had a lot of work on her hands. And, uh, and you know, she would pull this quote out, uh, which was from JFK, which was, you know, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. That's <laughs> and right. So the mother country, you know. And But it's something that really stayed with me because that's from, you know, 1960-something. Um, and Or I think actually it was during his campaign, so it was probably even before 1960 that, that he said that famous quote. Um, but I think, you know, it sort of represents an idea, right, or, or an ideology of how you can kind of go through life. You know, you're are you waiting for for the organization, the boss to tell you what to do or to take ownership of something? Or are you seeing areas of, of ownership where you can actually take that opportunity, take that initiative? And I, I wanna go back to something that I know you focus on as well, which is culture. And I think yeah. there are certain organizations where the culture is such that you feel that when you come in and you know, I'm gonna be able to take ownership of things here. 
but it's not a given uh, because of of that sort of you know thing that's even might be unconscious of like my organization is going to tell me what to do, so I'm just going to wait and see what they say, right? There are organizations in which you come in and you you feel that, but I, I'm curious because you do so much work on this. I mean, how do you how do you create such a culture where there is that that sense of ownership? Yeah, and that's I love this question. This is one of my favorite topics. You know, culture is the collective behavior of a team or a group of people. And if you're not careful in an organization, it just happens. Hmm. If you're not intentional about it in an organization, it just happens. And it it's most often not what you want. So when you do walk into an organization and you feel it, there's often an intentionality around it. And I think the intentionality is, what is the culture we want? What are the behaviors and actions that will encourage that culture? And then what do we do to demonstrate it, lead it, and practice it? And in my own experience, I'm, I'm a big believer and proponent of culture, and I like to lead through a culture lens. So I often not often, in my teams that I manage directly, I always, when somebody new joins, I talk about there are four foundational pillars to our culture. They flow from the four values of our organization. Mm -hmm. And to that, our team then adds two other cultural imperatives. So there are six items that form the basis of our culture on the teams that I lead. And there's stories and examples of that. And then there's also an acknowledgement that we're not going to be perfect at it, but you have a chance to contribute to it, to give feedback and to make it better. So that's that's somebody new saying, this is your starting point. And then every time there's large team gatherings, we come back and share culture stories or culture examples and reconnect with culture. But if you listen to it, all of that is what's the culture we want? What are the behaviors, actions, results, and values that will drive that culture? And then the ongoing talk, storytelling, and even correction against the culture mm. um, to make it real. And if you don't do that, it will just become the culture that's the path of least resistance from the behavior of the people. Mm. Yeah, you know, and it's interesting because in my in my experience, um, you know, that that sense of permission, comes from that culture in terms of, you know, I, I am allowed and empowered even to make my own decisions, to take initiative, to yeah. take ownership of a project that may not have been necessarily mine at the beginning, but I, I have, I have permission to have those conversations. And I think that example you gave earlier of, you know, that, that person that said, well, wait a second, in the, in what you're asking there, where's your ownership? That's a culture, right? That's that's in other organizations that don't have that particular culture. Maybe that person wouldn't have felt that they had the authority or permission or were allowed or empowered to even say that. Maybe they wouldn't even have thought it, right? And so I'm curious in terms of people you've worked with, uh, like, do you have a, and, and to me that goes with with this idea of change as well, but do you have an example of, you know, someone you've worked with where, there's been that change. There's been that aha moment. And what was the before and after of that? Yeah, yeah. Let me let me connect one dot from the the, the mm. what you were just saying there, and then Please. I'll answer that. So when when the um, consultant asked that to the employee, "What's your ownership?" That connects directly to our second company value called "Live the Principles We Teach," and. One of the principles we teach from seven habits is this idea of being proactive and owning your own behavior. And so it connects directly back into our cultural underpinning. And you were highlighting that. I just wanted to pull that thread through mm -hmm. so you could see yeah. everybody knows that. Everybody knows that. Mm -hmm. And what, what's been so interesting to lead through culture is I found culture spits people out, not in a negative way. But if, if they don't want to or feel like they belong in the culture, it's probably one of the most painfully obvious things to them and everybody else that there's a misalignment there. And as a result, they, they choose to go find a place where they're aligned. And I view that as a gift to them and to us because it says, 
No, we really want to live and be who we are and accomplish our own great purposes. And if that doesn't align with who you want to be and your own great purposes, we love you like crazy. Go find a place where you fit. Mm. And, and it tends to create this correction, which is a pretty cool thing to watch. Mm -hmm. And so I've seen culture um, spit people out, isn't the right word, but it does. It, it, it says, find, find a place where you do fit. And there is nothing more rewarding than the opposite of that, which says, gosh, you're here and there's an opportunity in front of you. Do you want to choose to be part of our culture and make a contribution or not? And coaching somebody to that outcome is one of the most rewarding things as a leader because it, it helps them see a vision of what we can be as a company and it helps them change mindset and behavior and then it, it helps them see that they can flourish hmm. and, and i've had lots of people where that's the case and it, it's it's not always easy we had somebody recently say to one of the leaders on a team she said, you know, I've been in lots of organizations where I haven't fit culturally. Hmm. And she used that word because she comes from um, a, a, a different geographic culture as well. And, and she said, I finally realized I need to change so that I can fit in and succeed. Hmm. And it's not that we're saying, don't be who you are. We value everything who you, that you are. And we value your experience and your geographic and ethnic culture. But there's a company culture we want you to fit into. And, and if you're willing to step up and fit in there, then there's a place for you long term. And there was that moment, that light bulb that went mm -hmm. off for her. And you think, yes, we made a difference in her career because it's been a challenge for years. Mm -hmm. And now there's a moment to say, oh, I can choose to be different and be part of this. It's yeah. really rewarding. I love really that. Rewarding. I love that because it's that it's the, you know, it's, it's, so we also say a lot, Jules, uh, you know, in our line of work is that the collective is made up of individuals. And, and so it's very hard to change the collective without first going into the individuals and creating those mindsets and behaviors, like you said, and, and getting people to see something that's not always visible. And so when that happens, it's so rewarding. And I get that. And especially, I think, for individuals, you know, in, in my experience, there's so many times when we, we're carrying stuff uh, from our past, whether that's our culture, our background, our education, whatever it is, you name it. And there's a lot of that stuff that's that's buried, but that causes us to behave in certain ways. And we just take them for granted, essentially. And so I think for me, the work is the work around change. I'm really glad you spotlighted this because that's where it lives. It, it lives in the individual. And if the individual, if you yourself are not willing to stretch yourself to, to grow in some ways and to perhaps let go of things that aren't serving you anymore, they served you really well, but now it's time to let go of some of those things or to transform them into something else. Um, you know, you're never going to be able to grow. And then that's when we kind of fall into that trap of like, well, it's the, it's the CEO's fault. It's the culture's fault. It's the challenge. It's, it's this and that. And, you know, I'm sure there, you can find connections like that, but yeah. ultimately the individual has to take a, a, a hard look at themselves as well. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you talked about all these different lenses, these different experience lenses that influence our behavior. One of the things I've observed is you start to accumulate those sets of behaviors, beliefs, and ideas. And if nobody ever gives you any feedback to help you see that that one is good and that one is less helpful, you just keep marching forward with those glasses on. Mm -hmm. And one of the things in the three C's that we've included is this idea of how to communicate with courage and consideration. Courage, meaning I need to share with you what matters to me in the organization and consideration of I want to respect who you are and trying to get that balance right. And sometimes I think if we're not careful, we let the consideration be the heavy weight there. And as a result, people have permission to carry on with these experience lenses that don't help them. Mm -hmm. They don't help the culture. They don't help them grow. They don't help them become their best self. 
So part of what we try and do as we look at these three C's is say, how can we learn to have high courage and high consideration conversations mm. to, to create the conditions for that person to become an even better version of themselves? Mm. I love that. I love that. Um, well, Bills, I, I want to make sure we get to your question because I'm looking oh, at the time yeah. here um, around the book, Who Moved My Cheese? <laughs> well, yes. See, just like I always like to learn about somebody's backstories, I always, when I worked at an organization, I always wanted to understand the company DNA, mm. what got them started, what informed their experience. So way back when you all worked on a book that was one a very unusual title, Who Moved My Cheese? Yeah. And remember a few minutes ago, I talked about this multinational company that was doing everything from HR to structure mm -hmm. to product at the same time. And my boss handed me this book one day in the hall and all of us, who moved my cheese? So for a long time, I've been curious to see what prompted the title and the premise. So just humor yeah. me for a minute before we move yeah. on to our usual ending and question. No, that's good. I'm, I'm glad to talk about this. So the author of the book was Spencer Johnson, a good friend of mine. I worked with him for 10 years. And Spencer was a medical doctor by training, but never practiced. And then he started writing books and he wrote books for kids called Value Tales. And they tried to tell the story of historical characters and what, what values you could learn from them. And then he partnered with Ken Blanchard and wrote The One Minute Manager. So they got into this parable space. And the parable storytelling was really Spencer's gift. Ken had all the business experience. And obviously they did it together, but um, Spencer was a, a genius at storytelling because he would revise and revise. Anyway, one time he was telling this story out loud and um, somebody overheard him and said, you ought to write that down. And he wrote it down and he revised it and he revised it. And then he took it to a few workshops that um, Ken was running and tested it with some people in the room. And it was just really well received, the story of two mice and two little people in a maze. And um, people loved it and they connected with it. And so that led him to revise and do some more testing and actually publish the book. And um, it was just a story based on his own observation of human behavior. And Spencer's gift was to observe and then to try and tell the story and simplify it and simplify it and simplify it to the point where a few key ideas just emerged as, as these pearls. And, and that's the case in him with my cheese. When you read it, there are these, these aphorisms that show up and you're like, Oh my goodness, that is so true. And so for him, it was a little bit of a journey. It, it happened over years. Mm. It wasn't this, I'm going to sit down and write this. It was this over years um, journey to tell the story. And I joined with them as the book had come out and we were making videos of it that were being used for training and we were working with organizations. And it was pretty special. You know, the book sold 45 million copies. It's still in circulation. Yeah. Well, it's it's too. transformative. <laughs> yeah, I, I, had, I had one moment, I'm going to tell you a quick story. I had one moment where I was trying to make a decision and one of the aphorisms in the book says, what would you do if you weren't afraid? And my wife looked at me and said, what would you do if you weren't afraid? And I said, did you really just say that to me? <laughs> but but it's so powerful because it helps you challenge your paradigms. Um, really, really a, a great season professionally working with him. He was, he was a great storyteller and great at simplifying wisdom into just really small bite-sized learnings. But I used yeah. that book as a thinking prompt afterwards when I was writing, saying that was a bold move to use that. as like, that's going to be my go-to, you know, call to action, everything. Yeah. So I'm calling my boss, my old boss in Louisville, Kentucky. Do it. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I it. have, I have scoop finally of where this all came from. So yeah. 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 Well, uh, our final question for, for, for this round. Um, and I really, uh, so appreciate you coming back on, onto the show, Curtis. And, and uh, I mean, we could, I personally could, could talk for hours about, about these topics. Um, yeah. But but we do have to come to an end, and 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 you know we we uh, we were just talking about the experience lens and uh, or the various lenses we have according to the various experiences that have happened to us, and uh, and you know some you let go of, some are not helpful, some are helpful. But for this last question, I'm very curious. In your case, what's an experience that has shaped who you are today? In other words, that still 
kind of influences you, informs you, something that's still helpful to you? <laughs> yeah, there are so many, but let me let me pick one that relates to the courage and consideration because mm. that's the case for there. Um, 20, when, I'm trying to think how long it was, a long time ago, 25 years ago, I was living in England, which in and of itself was quite meaningful, a great experience, but I had some real frustration with something my boss had done. And this was, his email was just starting to come out. So I had thought long and hard over this email and I fired off this pretty um, grumpy email to my boss. <laughs> and <laughs> the the experience part of this is what happened next. Um, five minutes later, Tom picks up the phone and he calls me and he says, Curtis, that email tells me you're a little bit unhappy. Can we talk through it? Instead of firing back at me, the, the guy was 40 years my senior, right? Lots of experience, just really talented. And instead of firing back at me and putting me in my place, he, he paused, he observed my behavior, and then he started asking a lot of questions. And this is, this is a process that we use now at Franklin Covey to help with difficult conversations. And what it allowed him to do was to take that courage consideration kind of teeter-totter and slowly put it back into equilibrium. And he educated me. He made it clear where I was wrong. And he also made it clear where there were some things that could change. But he used this idea of courage and consideration um, not as a sledgehammer to give me high courage. Let me tell you what you need to know, young kid. Mm. Um, but he used it as an opportunity to listen, to teach, to correct, and to um, help me become a better version of myself in my career. And it's influenced how I interact with others for 25 years. Mm. And so... That, that's one that stands out and I nothing but admiration for Tom. He's long since retired, um, not with us, um, but nothing but admiration for how he handled that with years of experience uh, love it. tool belt. Yeah, love it. Thank you so much. And yeah, you know, we were, you. I, I love, I love asking these questions of our guests because what often comes back so much is, is, a, is an interaction with one other person. And it's something that someone said to you that has stuck with you. It's a behavior that they modeled for you. It's a leadership, whatever it is, or a value or something. But it's it's in that space between two people that that often happens. And we have so many people like this in our lives. Um, and, you know, a guest recently, Jules, I remember, told us, you know, I I one day picked up the phone and and thanked one of those people, you know, who was in my life. And, and it was 10 years later and it was out of the blue. And they were so grateful that I had done that, you know, and I think I just encourage everyone to think of those people that have been on your journey with you and they may not even realize what an impact they had. Remind them, remind them because it'll do something for them. It'll do something for you. So anyway, thanks for that, Curtis. Um, and uh, yeah, we're going to. We're going to, this uh, sadly has to come to a close, but it's, it's been a pleasure one more time yeah. and, um, and really a pleasure, uh, to, to co-host with you as well, Julianne. And, uh, yeah. uh, yeah, yeah, it's, it's really great. So for our listeners, if you all are, are interested in, in Franklin Covey's work and Curtis's work, uh, in the show notes, you'll see a bunch of links that you can go to. We've also talked about, uh, these books that, uh, that Curtis Bateman, um, co-authored last time he was here, we were talking about change, how to turn uncertainty into opportunity. I still really recommend this book, uh, for those of you who have not gotten it yet. Uh, again, all these details will, will be in the episode notes, uh, which you can find on our website, narrative.com, N-A-R-A-T-I-V.com slash podcast. You can also go and find this podcast on any platform where you find uh, podcasts. To make sure you don't miss any of our podcasts, uh, subscribe to the podcast and also leave a review so that we can have the benefit of the wisdom of people such as Curtis given to many other people. Um, and finally, if you want to learn how to listen how to craft a story, how to tell a story, a really compelling story that's going to represent your culture, your values, your leadership traits, 
please come to us. We're always ready to listen. We've got uh, free consultation links that are available on our website, narrative.com. Uh, so don't hesitate to go there. We're always happy to listen to you, just as you are listening to us right now. <laughs> and those stories will help you get through the day in some important moments and make a change. I've That's seen right. it. Happen, so. That's yeah. right. That's right. Well, thank you, Jules. Thank you, Curtis. And uh, we will see you all next time. Thanks, everybody, for listening. For more information on the narrative listening and storytelling method and how it can help your business, go to narrative.com.